Hello, I'm Stephen Childs of virtualvoicelessons.net. I would like to welcome you to our breathing series. This lesson is entitled Exhalation. One of the most common subjects that any instructor of voice will cover during the first few voice lessons is without a doubt the topic of breathing. But unfortunately, what is also very common is the neglect to teach the whole picture. You see, many students of voice either hear about or are actually taught to some degree about inhaling. People almost always come into our studios with at least an expectation that they will be learning how to inhale correctly. You and I have spent quite a bit of time learning all the details and concepts that deal with this subject as well. But again, it is only half the picture. You see, singing is exhaling. I mean, think about it. What makes the voice come out of your mouth? Ultimately, it is air. The sound that we perceive as singing is generated through the exhalation of air. You know, it is amazing to me to think that all the beautiful and inspiring voices that I've ever heard throughout my life were created by releasing a poisonous pressurized gas. This gas, of course, being carbon dioxide. It is through the controlled release of carbon dioxide that sets the vocal folds into vibration. And the smoother the release, the smoother the voice. In fact, the majority of singing flubs can be attributed through improper exhalation. For example, if I hear students sing with a shaky, trembling voice, I know that they are not exhaling properly. The lack of pressure under the vocal folds, especially during high singing, is one main reason that people crack. There is simply not enough support to sustain the voice comfortably so it falters. Excessive breathiness can also be attributed to poor exhalation as well as vocal fatigue, inability to sing strong, poor vibrato, running out of air too soon or too often, singing flat, and so on. All of these areas can be corrected either completely or very close to it simply by exhaling properly for singing. But the problem with developing correct exhalation is that if we inhale incorrectly, we will exhale incorrectly. So this is the main reason all teachers of voice try to explain at least a little bit about inhaling because it hopefully enables us to exhale with a greater sense of control. You may recall me stating from past lessons that voice instructors suffer a great dilemma when it comes to training the singing voice. We have the challenge of training feelings. In other words, I cannot directly explain certain functions of the voice because it's not as if we turn on a switch or flip a lever and then suddenly we're singing correctly. There is a very sizable amount of voice training that is felt more than it is observed. This is clearly the case when it comes to teaching controlled exhalation as it applies to voice. The phrase, sing from your diaphragm, is a great example of this. The idea behind this set of instructions is so that we generate strength from the lower part of our torso, but to do this, it may help to pretend that the voice is somehow produced there. So we inhale from the diaphragm and then we sing from that area. Now, the technical problem with this statement is that we, of course, do not generate sound from the diaphragm. Vocal sound is obviously generated inside the larynx through rapid beatings of air by the vocal folds which are housed there. As a matter of fact, the diaphragm itself does not assist in exhalation at all, at least not in a muscle sense. It is through a release of air from the lungs, alveoli, which have elasticity to them and in turn expels carbon dioxide the same way a balloon forces air out when released. This is the way we expel air at rest. For forceful exhalation, there are four main muscle areas that expel the carbon dioxide from the lungs. These are the transversus muscles, which run from front to back and are the most important muscles behind forceful exhalation. The rectus abdominis. These are the muscles that we see when someone has a six pack, although it's in actuality the tendons that sheave this muscle group into sections. Oddly enough, there are not just six of these muscle packs, they're more like eight. The intercostals, 
These are the muscles between your ribs and are also known as your rib raisers. When we eat ribs, we're actually eating these muscles. The intercostals work so well for us as singers that we will learn a special breathing technique later on that is based around these delicious muscles, which we aptly named intercostal breathing. This breathing technique is more difficult to inhale than regular diaphragmatic breathing, but is far more effective in the exhalation. This is why this technique has also been called the breathing of the stars. Number four, the inner and outer obliques. These are muscles that are found in towards the lower back and sides. Number five, quadratus lumbertum. These are often quite simply called the back muscles and work directly with the intercostals. Many voice instructors actually place high emphasis on these muscles in particular and is where we get the term back breathing. When we talk about forceful exhalation, it is these muscles that pressurize and blast the air from out of our lungs. The muscles, when strung together, resemble a circle or a sphincter. And when they contract together, they literally squeeze the air out of our lungs. This is similar again to a balloon that is filled with air and has one hand holding the mouth of the balloon and the other hand squeezing around the middle. If I slowly let out the front opening of the balloon while squeezing, the stream of air is strong and controllable. If done right, we can actually make sustained sound on different pitches. There are several different ways that we can look at and describe the act of exhalation for singing. One of my favorite is the phrase, the point of suspension. You see, exhalation can be described simply as a balance between letting air out while holding it back at the same time. Or in other words, there's a perfect point where we actually suspend or balance the exhale. And that is what this phrase is describing, a point where we balance the air pressure. If we let out too much air, we get breathiness, shakiness, cracking, and so on. If we don't allow enough air flow out, we get tightness, low volume, and ultimately vocal damage. It is by maintaining this air pressure throughout each and every vocal phrase that we will have the control that we seek. An excellent analogy that I often use is one that most of us would never relate to singing. It's the way that we may use a garden hose. Now, have you ever turned on a garden hose to water your lawn, wash your car, spray your neighbor's cat? <laughs> Don't laugh. You know that you have. <laughs> now, when you're spraying the cat, you want to make the water as strong as possible. I mean, usually the water just kind of flops out of the end of the hose. Not much of a threat to the little cat. But wait, you have a great idea. You decide to place your thumb over the end of the hose and like magic, the water shoots out and has become far more controllable and powerful. You found the water's point of suspension. You see, what happened is this. By blocking the flow of water with your thumb, the water starts to build pressure inside the hose. It's building up and building up until finally you let your thumb off just a little and out comes the water at that very pressure you just built up. And you can maintain that pressure until you finally release your thumb off the end of the hose and the water returns to its weak, uncontrollable, pre-cat drenching state. Now the main question that is in front of us now is, how do I hold the point of suspension during singing? Because obviously I'm not gonna use my thumb in any way. The answer is this, we must maintain subglottal air pressure. The opening to the back of our throat has a very strange name given to it by voice doctors and others who deal in the medical side of the throat, this being the glottis. Now underneath the glottis lies the larynx, and within the larynx, we find the vocal folds, or what are more commonly referred to as the vocal cords. And it is the vocal folds themselves that act as a thumb draped over the end of the garden hose. When we begin to sing, the folds come together as is shown here in these photos. 
And as you can see, we have vocal cords that are not engaged, and then we have them engaged. So when we finally go to exhale, the muscles of expiration squeeze together, putting pressure under the diaphragm, which in turn places pressure on the lungs, expelling the gas carbon dioxide from the lungs. So here comes the gas, up from the bronchia, up through the trachea, and finally slamming into the now closed vocal cords. And because the vocal cords are sealed tight, vocal pressure starts to form under them. This is subglottal air pressure. And if we maintain this pressure, just like the garden hose, we can also have a steady stream of controlled carbon dioxide blowing past the vocal folds, sending them into vibration. As I mentioned earlier, there is a very sizable amount of voice training that is felt more than is observed. The point of suspension is one of them. How do we explain to someone how we push things out of their bodies without using the word push? You know, I'll never forget when I was first teaching my son how to use the bathroom like a big boy. I remember sitting him down on the very scary and rather disproportionately sized toilet and saying, OK, son, now push. And you know what he did? He flexed his hands, and he put a snarl on his face, and he looked like he was ready to, to pass out. My son wasn't pushing at all. He was flexing, and the two are often mistaken for one another. You see, pushing is a hard thing to describe. And just to let you know, I did eventually have success teaching my boy how to push while on the toilet. But what I remembered was that there are other areas in life that we may have to learn how to push rather than flex. Birthing a baby is one of them. So many expecting couples take Lama's classes together. I know my son's mother at the time insisted I go to those classes as do most women who are expecting. Now, it's funny the word insisted actually doesn't seem to really describe how adamant she was for me to go to those classes and not teach those nights. So what I saw were classes that were teaching women had to breathe through labor. And what I later understood was that it wasn't just to make the pain less severe for my wife, but in order that she could better bear down or push when the doctor asked her to. That's the little secret that is not led on to in Lamaze classes, because what may happen is that the mother, instead of pushing, actually winds up flexing, which can lead to excessive tearing and prolonged labor. It's funny that my wife back then had no idea <laughs> that I would be using the classes that she insisted I go to to use for this training seminar. Anyway, looks like I did win. So let's just take a moment to review what we have learned when it comes to the breathing process for controlled singing. Number one, we must always remember to maintain an upright posture in order that our lungs have room enough to fill with oxygen and so that we won't have to lift the chest during inhalation as that will then cause my neck to tighten. Number two, we must then inhale through the mouth by allowing the stomach to drop downwards. Next, we must build a pressure inside the body by employing the transversus, rectus abdominis, intercostals, obliques, as well as the back muscles that act like a sphincter muscle group, which will literally squeeze the air out of us. This act is difficult to describe in words, so we will give you exercises to help you discover what it means to push. And finally, we will try our best to maintain a point of suspension by keeping a balance of air pressure under the vocal folds themselves. This subglottal air pressure is a feeling that cannot be shown directly but is taught more as a feeling. What we'll show is when it is performed correctly. When this concept of subglottal air pressure is maintained, the voice will feel and sound comfortable. It will feel and sound controllable. It will simply feel and sound right. So to finally answer the challenge that is laid in front of every good voice instructor, which is, how do I teach the feelings? The answer is, the voice will tell all. It will simply sound better, and that is as good as a visual help 
as anyone could ever be. This concludes the study of exhalation. I am Stephen J. Childs, and I would like to thank you for listening, and God bless.